All right, Luke chapter number one, if you will. Luke chapter number one. And uh, we haven't been in Luke for quite a bit. So we introduced it last time. And uh, I want to go on and get into the context here, into the chapter. Uh, before I do, I made a comment apparently in the last, uh, in the introduction about Luke being a gen, possibly being a Gentile. And if he, and I think that he is a Gentile, and I explained all that at the time based upon some stuff that Paul writes in Colossians. If Luke is a Gentile, then he is a proselyte because he is a member of the little flock. He's a member of the kingdom program. He's a member, he, he's a promoter of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. So he's not a member of the church, the body of Christ, but he is a member of the little flock. So if he is a Gentile, and again, my own personal opinion is that he is, then he would be a proselyte Gentile, someone who's come and joined himself in and gone through the various methods, okay? So now, Luke chapter 1, verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first to write unto thee, in order, most excellent Theopolis, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Now, when we come to Luke, Luke, Luke is going to present the Lord as in his humanity. Matthew presents him as king. We looked at this last time. As king, Mark presents him as the servant. Luke is going to present him as the man. John presents him as who he is, the son of God. And in that, Luke is going to come in now, and he's going to give some... Uh, he, Luke's a doctor, so he's going to pay attention to the details. Verse 1, for as much as many... So not just the apostles, but there's a lot of different places that Luke is going to go get information from. He's going to talk to Zach, uh, he's going to talk to, to Zacharias. He's going to talk to Elizabeth. He's going to go talk to Mary. He's going to come over and, and talk to uh, chapter two here, uh, verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name uh, was. Uh, S S Simeon, Simon, uh, Simeon. So he's going to talk to Simeon. He's going to go down and talk to Anna in verse 36. He's going to go uh, interview the shepherds. He's going to go interview all of these different people. So he's he's going to be a he's going to be a great uh, place to get the testimony of the life of Christ. He's going to come along and he's going to he's going to step in and say here. I went and did, I, Theopolis, what I did was I went and I got eyewitnesses, verse 2, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. And if, if, if that thing about eyewitnesses, uh, come over to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. So the eyewitnesses from the beginning, that's going to be the apostles. He goes and interviews them. Walks in, sits down with Peter, and says, hey, tell me about this, and he interviews him. John 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. And again, people got, he got them together. If you come back to 1 Peter, uh, actually, 2 Peter. 1, 2 Peter 1, he got people together and he got different groups of people actually to give an account. In 2 Peter 1, verse 16, uh, verse 15, Peter writes, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunning devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And that is going to be in relationship to 
the Mount of Transfiguration. So when we come back into Luke, as we get to introduce the book here, and as we get into the storyline, we get really a good look into quite a few things. One is the level of education that people in the first century had. Most of the time, everybody says the first century people, they could barely write their name. And we're going to find out that that's just not the case at all. They're, they're really uh, highly educated people. They're, you know, we, we studied this morning about Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos, eloquent in the Scriptures, mighty in the Scriptures. He knew that. He understood that. So when Luke comes in and he says, hey, I, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, there's, he, there's a great mass of public record, of eyewitnesses' accounts that Peter is literally going to read and he's going to go through and he's going to understand it. He's going to go verify it. If you come over talking about like Mary, if you look there in chapter 2 at verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The only place you read that is in Luke because he's Dr. Luke. He sat with her, and you tend to tell your doctor more than you would ever tell a husband or wife, and yet he got it out of her. So he's really going to sit down, and he's going to validate, he's going to verify the, the different records, Luke 1.1, 1, 1, the, the, the set forth in order, a declaration of those things which are most, for as much as many have. So there's a, there's a lot of this over here, of record, and, and Luke says, I'm going to come in and verify all of that and look at it and get into it. That's what he says in verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order. Most, he's, I, I, you see this big volume of information? I'm going to come up now and I'm going to go and I'm going to interview the eyewitnesses. I'm going to validate. I'm going to verify so that Theopolis you know as well that everything is good to go. It's legitimate. And the, the volume, so first of all, we have this understanding that the people of the first century and prior to that, they're highly educated. They've taken in hand. They've written stuff down. It's not just oral tradition passed on. It's written down. Now, if you come back to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, you don't usually go to church in Second Chronicles, but we'll go back there. It's fascinating how the author of our Bible, God, has no problem with you looking into and digging out things and looking at the evidence. He actually encourages it. He talks to, to Israel and he says, come and let's reason together. Let's look into this. Paul gets in here and he says, study it, read it, get into it. If you look at 2 Chronicles 27... Verse 7, now the rest of the acts of Jotham, now Jotham is the king of Judah, and all his wars and his ways, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. So there's a book, a histor history record of the kings of Israel and Judah, and Chronicles he says, hey, you want to know all the details, go to get the history book off the shelf and read. Now, all that information isn't here in Scripture, but what did the writer do? He reached over, God, the Holy Spirit, through the human author, reaches over, pulls out, and puts in what needs to be there. Look in chapter 29 of 2 Chronicles. It's fascinating to look at the books that are mentioned in the Bible. Uh, uh, 29, 29. 2 Chronicles 29, oh, well, it's not the verse. 29, 29, not the verse. Oh. So go to 35, <laughs> number next. Uh, no, chapter 35, I'm sorry, chapter 35. Chapter 35. And verse 26, chapter 35 and verse 26. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah, 
and His goodness, according to that which was written in the law of the Lord, and His deeds, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Go, now, I know what it is. It's in First Chronicles. So run back to First Chronicles 29, 29. First Chronicles 29, 29. So we have books. And what, I want, what I'm, I'm getting at is there's a mass of pu pu public record, okay? 29, 29, 1 Chronicles 29, 29. Now the acts of David, the king, first and last. Behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, the book of Nathan, the prophet, and in the book of Gad, the seer. You see those three different books? Now we have a Samuel, okay, so we can get that. We don't have a book of Nathan. Nathan is... David's prophet, he's his guy. So Nathan evidently has done what? He's kept a journal of all of the activity of David. It's not scripture, but what is it? It's being used to substantiate some of the information. Samuel, he anointed David. Nathan, that's the prophet who goes to David and says, you're the man, you did this, okay? Second, go back into Second Chronicles. It's just fascinating. I, I look at this and go, wow, <laughs> you don't pay attention to the richness back here. Look at Second Chronicles 9. Um, if I counted right, there are about 14 different books that are referenced in Chronicles, if I counted them right. If you look at chapter 9 and look at verse 29, now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan, the prophet, and in the prophecy of Ahiah, the, the Shilonite, and in the vision of Idu, the seer, against Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? The book of Nathan, there, that showed back up again. So evidently, he had also been journaling and, and historically recording the, book, the, the things of, of Solomon. Come over to chapter 12 of 2 Chronicles. Chapter 12, verse 15. Now the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaiah, the prophet? Isn't that interesting? Who's that guy? And yet what did he do? He documented, it's there, it's public record, that this book sits down at the library or at the city council or whatever, and you can go over, it's a reference book, pull it out. So what did, what did the writer of Chronicles do? The Holy Spirit causes the human author to go over and pull out the information on Rehoboam out of that book and to write it down in the Scripture. Chapter 13. It's just fascinating how this kind of just works out. Chapter 13, verse 22. The rest of the acts of Abiah and his ways and his stories are written in the story of the prophet Edu. Idu. Isn't that interesting? There's just, again, there's an overwhelming information here. So when we come back to Luke 1, Luke starts off by saying, we need to be aware of all of this information out here it's, a, it's of, of the life of Christ, the public record here. And I'm going to boil it down for you, and I'm, we're going to have a, an understanding, verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theopolis. I'm going to take all this in, verse 4, that thou mightest know the reason, that, the intent, Thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Now, so now Luke says, I've been a good historian. I went out, I verified the information from the sources themselves, the eyewitnesses. And it's not a he said, she said type of thing. It's rather, what did the witnesses say directly? He interviews them, he looks at them, I have perfect understanding of it. I've diligently, carefully followed up. I've, take, I've, I've talked to them directly. You know, you need two or three witnesses and so forth, and that's what he did. The other thing that, again, the second issue, I guess, in this is God expects us to 
to examine the, the evidence, to come in and to look at it, and to come to every man be per fully persuaded in his own mind. Look at it, say, here it is. By the way, the book of Nathan, the book of Edu, and all those guys, that stuff got destroyed in some of the wars in Israel over time. You can't go, if you Google it, you can't find it on Google, okay, Google Books. But it's referenced, it's also referenced in some of the historical evidence of uh, in mankind that they did exist. God says, let's go examine it. He's, God is not offended for you and I to stop and to look at the evidence. He wants us to. Because our faith is based on what? What His Word says, and we need to know that it's accurate and true. And again, in, in today's society, there's such a lack of biblical knowledge and understanding, so we need to get into that. Verse 3, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order. Most excellent Theophilus. Now, in order, not chronological order, okay, but rather a orderly presentation. Matthew, we study Matthew. He groups the events. Matthew is here's what the king says. So the events in Matthew are grouped together that way. Mark, we're studying Mark on Wednesday night. That's a snapshot at what the servant's going to do. So there are things that aren't in Mark that are Matthew. There's a genealogy. Mark, there isn't. The genealogy in Matthew establishes the Lord's rightful claim to the throne of Israel. Mark, we don't care where the servant came from. We just care that he can work. Luke, there is a genealogy because Luke is going to establish the kinsman redeemer aspect of who the Lord is. John, well, God doesn't have a beginning or an end. He's from everlasting to everlasting, so there's no genealogy. So when he says in order here, he's not talking about chronologically order, but rather grouped together that's going to tell us the story of the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he's going to do. Now, if you look at Luke 1, we've got Theopolis. Let's talk about him real quick. Go to Acts 1 and look at verse 1. And Acts 1 tells us, <laughs> Acts 1 is Luke volume 2, if you will, because Luke is the writer of Acts. Watch what he says, the 1-1. One, one. The former treatise have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Isn't that interesting? The, he calls the former presentation of the information, he calls it a treatise. He says that, that previous presentation of the info, now we're going to come over here and do something else. I'm going to give you the, the volume two. Okay? Back to Luke 1. He calls Theopolis most excellent. And that's a title. By the way, the, word, the name Theopolis means a friend of God. Okay? Now, that's as much as we know about Theopolis. There's not uh, a lot of information about who he is. There's a lot of speculation. But again, when Scripture's silent, sometimes it's best to just be silent. But he uses that term, that title, most excellent. So if, if you come back over to Acts 23, that title, most excellent, uh, carries with it uh, a connotation here. Uh, Acts 23, 26. Claudius Lysias, unto the most excellent governor, Felix, sendeth greeting. See how he uses that most excellent connected to the governmental offices there? Chapter 24. Look at verse 3. We accept it always, and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. See that most noble, most excellent? So evidently, it is possible, because of the most excellent Theopolis, that this gentleman is a governmental official who's had a, who's, who Luke is having a relationship with. Now, my own personal observation of this is if Luke is the doctor, a physician, and I'm his client, his patient, and we get into a conversation about this man, Jesus Christ, 
and I'm of a high-ranking position, if you will, then it would be natural that, that he could be saying, hey, O Theopolis, most excellent, I'm writing this for you to understand, but then also for everybody else, that there's been a, a validation and examination of the evidence. Now, again, that's just my thought about how I would think about it. But again, we don't have a lot about Theopolis. I know a lot of people have speculated on it. I think personally, he's most excellent. I think he's in the government of Rome there in some manner, or even within maybe Israel. But he is a patient of Luke, and so Luke has a relationship with him in such a manner as we would with anybody. I, I don't know about you, but I talk to the water meter, the guy that comes around and gets the meter, the water numbers off the house and the gas. He's a city official. I was out the other day. He walked up on me. And I startled him because I was behind the truck and he didn't see me. And he went, oh, hey, how you doing? I go, good, how are you? <laughs> and it was a different guy than normal. So I didn't know his name or anything. But the normal guy, he's a little skinny, redheaded dude. He just comes and does. And But I get to talk to him. I talk to the garbage man. You know, you just talk. And these guys are government officials, if you will. And I think that's what we have here, possibly with Theophilus. Obviously, He's a Gentile, he's a friend of Luke, and he's a believer. So he too is going to end up, we would call a proselyte, Gentile, a member of the believing remnant. And I'll be honest with you, I hate having to say it that way, because the believing remnant is predominantly Jewish, but there are Gentiles who believe and join and do. And, you know, you have in Acts, you have... Uh, Cornelius as an illustration. It's just not the goal of, the, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The goal, the focus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the earthly ministry of Christ. He's the minister of the circumcision. But you can't discount the Gentile seeing that, believing that he is Israel's Messiah, and then joining with them. And again, I, it just frustrates me when you can't just teach it, and you got to have every little dot and I cross so that people don't misunderstand that. So Luke is writing to Theophilus. And what he says is, I've been a good historian. I've looked at all the testimony so that you can know with certainty about what you're reading and about what we're talking about. So that brings in the certainty of the scriptures Okay, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But what that tells us is that in the inspiration of God, in the, in the, in the giving forth of the, of the information, holy men are moved as the Spirit speaks to them and so forth, Peter says, is that they, that doesn't override the, hum, the nature, the personality, let me say it like that, of the writer. Matthew is a tax collector He's all things government. If you read Matthew with the government in mind, it's, very, it's a governmental treatise, statements. Mark is a servant. He's always been a servant. And yet he writes with, uh, with that energy of the servant. Luke, a doctor, the detail. So we have that going on here as well. So Luke, he's going to go out, he's going to verify all the facts. He's going to get them together. He's going to put them in a nice, neat, orderly uh, presentation. And he's going to start. And the story starts in verse 5. There was the days of Herod, the king of Judas, I'm sorry, of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in age. So now he's going to jump right into the story. And he, again, he does it with great detail. Zacharias and, Eli and Elizabeth are going to be a picture of, of the nation of Israel at their best, that little flock. Here's a picture of it. Zacharias, uh, the name, his name means uh, Jehovah, remember. Okay? Elizabeth, 
her name means the oath of God. So you have Israel's hope is going to lie in Jehovah remembering his oath to them, if you put it together, okay? Now, that, so what we're going to see here is we're going to see Zacharias and Elizabeth. Zacharias, he's a priest, so he's in the, he's of the, he's in the priestly department. Elizabeth is also, she's a, one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. You go back to Exodus 6, and Aaron's wife, you know what her name is? Elizabeth. So you have this picture here of John the Baptist's parents. In the, they're in the priestly line. That's where they're at. And that's going to develop into a picture here of what's happening in the nation of Israel because what's their condition in verse 7? They had no children because they... Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. Now that represents the spiritual condition within Israel. Here's what Israel should look like at her best, but yet what's their spiritual condition? Barren. They're not able to enjoy the the benefits of the priestly line, the benefits of the oath that was given to them of God. So they're in trouble here. So what Luke is going to do here is he's going to introduce to us the kinsman redeemer. And he's going to introduce it through, here's John the Baptist. Why? Because before the the redeemer can show up, who's got to show up? The crier in the wilderness. Make straight the pass. Here he is. So he starts right at the beginning. And he starts with the voice in the wilderness, John the Baptist. But when by doing that, he also... It's going to give us so much detail. And we go through this passage a lot at Christmas time because the Lord wasn't born on December 25th. Something else happened of much more miraculous than a birth, and that's the conception. And here's how we know it. Now, notice what he does in verse 5. The, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah. You see that issue of Herod. Now, you you have to be careful with the Herods, because Herod is like the name president. It's given out to, he's in the family. (laughs) If you look over at chapter 3, look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judah, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch. You see all that? But do you see that Herod there? A tetrarch being tetrarch of Galilee. That means he was only in charge of a quarter of the area. He wasn't in charge of the whole area. Remember when Herod finds out that the Lord is from Galilee and he sends him over to um, the other guy? I just lost his name. Pilate sends him to Herod. Why? Because Herod's tetrarch of Galilee. So the Herod names here, you have to be really careful of. Because the Herod in 3.1 is the son of the Herod in 1.5. When you get out the, actually, Bullinger's... uh, companion bible it's got a great section on these guys in his appendixes that kind of you got you got to scratch your head at if you come over to uh acts chapter 12 acts 12 here's another herod acts 12 verse 1 now about that time herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church this is the Herod, this is Agrippa I. He's the grandson of the Herod in Luke 1, 5. So, I mean, again, you can go read Josephus, you can read, uh, again, Bullinger's appendix thing, and <laughs> it's just interesting how if you're not paying attention, the Herods kind of gum up the works a little bit, okay? If you look at Acts 25, Acts 25 and verse 13. And after certain days, King Agrippa, 
and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. You see Agrippa? This is Herod Agrippa II. He's the son of the Herod Agrippa I of Acts 12, and he's the great-grandson of Herod the Great back there in Luke 1. Are you confused yet? My point is just be careful with it. So go back to 1.5. Because what, and by the way, the marking there, the, 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 the timing there, uh, really begins to have to do with them dating the, the uh, Schofield uh, Usher's date here has 7 B.C. Okay? Well, you get over to the birth of Christ, and it's 5 B.C., some say 4 B.C. So how do you, you know, and so they start play, uh, doing a, a number thing, if you will. But what I want you to see is what Luke is doing. He's not just saying, yeah, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were up there. They did this, this, and this. He's got the detail down because watch what he does in verse 5. A certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. Now, when he says the course of Abiah, verse 8 and it came to pass that while he has executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. So we've got some timing here that we can look at and we can, we can feather out what's happening. And when you begin to think about the course of Abiah, well, come back to 2 Chronicles 24. I'm sorry, 1 Chronicles 24. And you begin to understand where we're at in the life and the time here of Israel. In Second, in First Chronicles 24, you remember Aaron? He had four boys, and then two of them got swallowed. Uh, the um, uh, man, what am I? I'm just the names are just. Nadab and Abihu, they offered strange fire till the earth opened up. So now Aaron only has two boys. Well, one boy's got more descendants, male descendants, than the other boy does. So King David steps in, 24-1. Now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. But Nadab and Abihu died before their father and had no children. Therefore, Eleazar and Ithamar executed the priest's office. And David distributed them. So David's got to step in now, King David, and he's going to orderly put a, put, a func put a calendar together, and he's going to lay out, okay, you're here, you're here, you're here, you're here, you, 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 and he's going to, so there's not an unequitable situation here. And he does that. Verse 5, Thus were they divided by lot, one sort with another, for the governors of the sanctuary and the governors of the house of God were of the sons of Eleazar and the sons of Ithar, Ithamar. Okay? And Shemaiah, the son of Nithim, the scribe, one of the Levites. So, they, so now he's going to lay it out. Verse 7, Now the first lot came forth, See verse 10, the seventh to Hekaz, the eighth to Abiah. That's our Abiah. So the eighth week after Passover is going to be the course of Abiah. So Passover, eight weeks out, okay? Um, come back to 2 Kings. Uh, well, in verse, yeah, 2 Kings. I think it is, 11, 2 Kings 11, Second Kings 11, verse 9, and the captains over the hundreds did according to all things that Jehida the priest commanded, and they took every man his men and were to come in on the Sabbath with them that should go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. So what are they doing? Each course is a week long. They're going to go two times a year. Come over to Exodus 12. They're going, to, they're going to go in two times a year. They're going to do their thing. The eighth week out is the course of Abiah. 
So eight weeks after Passover, what happens on Passover? They bring the lamb, the chief priest goes in, he go, does his thing. But then eight weeks later, here we are. Now watch Exodus 12. Exodus 12, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So when Israel looked at the calendar, their calendar doesn't start in January. It starts in our April, if you will. Abib or Nisan. Now look over at chapter 13. Chapter 13 and verse 4. This day came ye out in the month Abib. Okay? Now hold here. Come over to Leviticus 23. I'm trying to put this together. Leviticus 23. And look at verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. So it all starts on the fourteenth day of the first month of their calendar. So on April 14th, no matter where it lands in the week, is Passover. Boom, it starts. By the way, that's how, that's how you know that the Lord was killed on Passover, which was Thursday, not Wednesday, not Friday. And then you had a high day, and then you had a high Sabbath, and then you had, so you had a, a Sabbath, and then you had the regular Sabbath. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday he was, you know, done. So you've got... When, does, when is Zacharias up in the temple? Eight weeks after Passover. Eight weeks after Passover, that puts him down. Uh, come back to Luke 1. That puts him down in the, he's in, in late, the Passover is April 14th. Eight weeks later is June 13, 14, right in there, okay? Zacharias is up in the temple doing his job. His job is verse 10, Luke 1, 10, and the whole multitude of people were praying without at the time of incense. See, so his job was to, he was handling the incense in the time of prayer. So he's, by the way, the number eight is the number of new beginning. It's fascinating. Here it is, a new beginning. He's ready to start something new in Israel. Now, Luke 1, watch verse 5. He's up in the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, verse 8. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course. So Zacharias is up there doing his job. He's eight weeks after Passover. Verse 13 when we get down here, a wonderful verse. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Now, if you look at verse 12, or verse 11, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. The reason that that is the case, and the reason that Zacharias responded that way, it's for over 400 years there's been no communication from God from heaven. There's been 400 years of silence, roughly. He tells the writing prophets, you get this done. I'm, I'm going to give them a famine in the land, and that famine is going to be my word. So then he doesn't send enough. And the first angel to show up in 400 years is going to talk to Zacharias. No wonder fear fell over him. It's like, holy cow, what's going on here? Now, they've, they've got the Word of God. They're to learn and do from there. But boom, there he is. And what does he say? You're going to have a son. Elizabeth is barren, but you guys are going to have a son. Verse 23, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration was accomplished, he departed to his own house. He goes home. All right? That, so he's, he's on his way home. And by the way, across the page, they live in the hill country, verse 39, in the city of in, in a city of, of Judah. He doesn't tell you the exact name of the city, he just says outside of town in the hill country. So you give him a couple days to get home. Verse 24, Elizabeth conceives, hid herself five months, saying, verse 26, and in the sixth month, so six months later, 
So now, so if you think about it, April is 14th-ish is the Passover. Eight weeks later, June, early June, mid-June, he's in the thing. He's doing his job. He gets done late June. Uh, John the Baptist is conceived late June. Six months go by. Now the now you got Mary and all this is going to happen. And again, we're going to go through it, okay? Late December, Mary is visited. Verse 40, Mary Rose goes to town to visit. Verse 41, and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And that happens, verse 57, now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth the son. And Zacharias can talk, and they're saying, we're going to name him Zacharias. He said, no, we name him John. And then what happens? Chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and off goes Joseph and Mary, and the Lord's born. Except late September. Okay? The point is, is all the sto- it all starts in verse 5. And it all starts where the information gets rolling. What is Luke doing? Why all this detail? Matthew doesn't do that this detail with John the Baptist, because he's introducing to us the kinsman redeemer. And he says, hey, here's where it starts. It starts with us understanding John the Baptist and the one crying in the wilderness, make way straight, here he comes. Now look at verse 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Now, think about that. They're blameless, yet verse 7, what are they? They're childless. In spite of their believing, in spite of them walking under the, the law, they couldn't get the blessings of having children. There was a problem there. So the, the nation out there, She's representing the barrenness, uh, the, that spiritual condition of unable to bear fruit in the nation. You get a picture of it. But at the same time, you're getting a picture, a really a clear definition of what Old Testament righteousness looks like. Because they are both righteous before God. Why? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now, not faultless. You remember Paul keeping the law blameless, but not not sinless, faultless, sinless. Blameless isn't faultlessness. To, to, to be at fault means you, 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 you broke something. Blame, faultless is, I've never made a mistake. Blameless says, I made a mistake but then I went and dealt with it the way I'm supposed to deal with it. So when they violated the law, the commandment, what did they go do? They went and did the sacrifice to fix that. So what are they doing? They're walking by faith in the Word of God to them in the moment. So the blamelessness here is important to catch. They're both righteous, walking in all the the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. If you come over to to verse 18, verse 18, And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. You see, he, what did he do? He questioned the angel from God. Actually, the angel of God. See, he's questioning. He isn't on board fully. So what happened? Well, because you're blank. <laughs> You're, you're questioning it here. 
Again, he wasn't faultless. What are you going to, you're going to, there's, here's the situation, you're going to be able to speak. Now go back up to verse 6. And I think verse 6 is important to grasp because when you think about justification unto eternal life, when you think about justification in the Old Testament sense, you cannot think about it the way we are justified. That's the body of Christ. They had a different system. Notice, walking, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. The commandments. Here's what is, the commandments are what told Israel what to do. Remember Paul and Galatians, governors and tutors? Tutors and governors. Tutor, here's what you do. The governor restrains back, the governor on the motor, hold them back. That's what the ordinances are. The ordinances had to do with the sacrifices that were required to take care of their sin when they sinned. So Israel, they had a short account type system. And when a believer would violate the law because he's a sinner, the blood of bulls and goats never took it away, then he would go over there and do the the sacrifice required to remedy the condition, the offense. See, that's what he's getting at in verse 6. These, he's, Luke says, you know what, when you look at Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were both righteous before God. Why? Because they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. When they violated a piece, they immediately went and took care of it. And again, I understand there's a lot of discussion about the Old Testament justification and and all that, and you just you just gotta let that go because that's not you and I, it's them. And the issue with them is the same issue with you and I, and that is the issue of faith in the word of God to them. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When Noah got the word to build the boat, the ark, he's called He's a preacher of righteousness. He was righteous. He was perfect in his generation. Why? Because he went and he did what the Word of God told him to do. Abraham, the same way, same thing. So when you look here at Zechariah and Elizabeth, they're doing exactly what needs they were required to do. That's why I said they're a great picture of Israel in their prime. Here's what they should be doing. So Zacharias and Elizabeth are representatives here. They are exactly who that Old Testament saint were and what they were to be doing, what God told them to do. I don't know about you, but I think about, I call him the Joe Jew, (laughs) just an everyday regular guy we don't read about in Scripture, and what's he doing? He's trusting the Word, he's obeying the Word, and he goes and does it. When we were studying in Romans, uh, come back to Deuteronomy 10. When we were studying in, in, in the book of Romans there in chapter 15, where Paul goes takes that offering to the poor saints at Jerusalem. Why were there poor saints in Jerusalem? Well, God changed the program, but why? Because they were told to sell all they have, bring it, lay it at, Peter, at the apostles' feet, and they'd be taken care of. And what'd they do? They obeyed it. They went and did it. You remember Ananias and Sapphira? They didn't do it. They got in trouble. <laughs> cost them their life. But see, the thing is, is that's just every day, what are they, here's the word to us, and let's go do it. They're, the Old Testament saints are no different. We're no different. We hear the word, we believe it, we go and do it. Now, look, if you will, here at Deuteronomy 10, because that's what they're doing, is what the God had told them. Uh, Deuteronomy 10, oh man, and verse number 12. And now, Israel, What doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. That's that's what God requires of Israel. Come over to Micah. Micah, after Jonah. The book of Jonah, then Micah. Micah 6. When we get done studying Mark on Wednesday nights, we're going to move into these minor prophets, Lord willing. If the Lord comes back, we won't worry about it, but we don't need to. But Micah 6, 
Micah 6, verse 5. O my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. Remember, Baal, Balaam, Balak, and Baal, the, the unholy trinity, Numbers 23. Where, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? All those questions are really a rebuke. He's, verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? There's the issue. Faith working in them. Faith coming along. Look back there at chapter 5, verse 13. Thy graven image also will I cut off, thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. All that stuff in, in chapter 6 there, in verse 6 and 7, not that stuff at all. What's, what is it going to be? It's going to be faith that worked. And there's an outward expression there in verse 8, but to do justly. That's an outward expression of an inward faith that they were to have. See, it all starts with their heart. And that's exactly what we're seeing with Zacharias and Elizabeth come over or come back to Isaiah chapter 33 Isaiah 33 Isaiah 33 start in verse 10 now will I rise saith the Lord now will I be exalted now will I lift up myself ye shall conceive chaff ye shall bring forth stubble your breath as fire shall devour you and the people shall be as the burnings of lime, as thorns cut up shall they burn in the fire. Hear ye that are far off what I have done, and ye that are near acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath suppressed the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Notice the question. What's going on in Zion? Apostasy. So who's going to stand the, the fire, the judgment? Matthew 3, 11 and 12, verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. He's, this is a second coming tribulation passage. He that despiseth the gain of the oppressor, that shaketh his hand from holding of bribes, stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. That thing about the gain of the oppressions and his hands from holding of bribes, that's that issue of the mark of the beast there in Revelation and not being able to buy and sell and coming over here in the, in the dark corners and making deals to survive. You think about a dad watching his kids starving in this time because they will because he doesn't have any food and what's, what's he going to have to do? That dad believing the word of God knows that if his kids die, they're going to be resurrected into the kingdom over here because they're, we're doing what the Word says. Not over here in the corner making deals and bribes and getting paid off and taking things. Verse 16, He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. And, off, and on you go. All that activity, all that work that they're going to be involved in requires them to understand that it's going to be the walk of faith. That's what they're doing. So when you come back over here, I mean, we could go on and on. <laughs> you go to Leviticus, you go to Ezekiel. He tells them, I don't want your, I don't want your stinking sacrifices. I want your heart. And that's the issue. Come back to Matthew. Matthew. Well, 
Just come back to Luke, Luke 1. By the way, Paul tells us in Titus 3, it's not by works. They have works to do. They have things to do. Why? Because that's their program. They have to come in. They have to do. You're in Luke 1. Look over at Luke 10, just real quick. Luke 10. Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do and live? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as, they, as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do and thou shalt live. Isn't that interesting? That's where we're at with Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're right there. They're a, they're a wonderful picture of what the Old Testament saints were doing. What were they doing? They're righteous in God. Why? Because they're walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. How? Blameless. Not faultless. They still make mistakes. Why? Because the law never answered sin. It, the law just says, you're guilty. You're guilty. You're guilty, so do this. You're guilty, so do this. They never got to that part of understanding that we need a Redeemer. Well, Zacharias and Elizabeth will get there as we go through, okay? So we'll start next time in verse 7 and work our way down because the hour is up. But as we get going here in the, in the book of Luke, just a couple things. One, Luke's gathering up the information, evidence, and he's going to give us some great detail here as he's introducing, really, the, the issue of the kinsman redeemer. He's going to do it starting with John the Baptist and that the, the voice in the wilderness, the crier in the wilderness. Here comes the Messiah. It's time to repent and get on board and go. And when we get in, we'll get down into all that as we get into this a little more. Okay? All right, dearly Father, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for your word and for the look into it. We thank you for the Luke and the evidence that we have here to study and to get out and to just rejoice in our Lord and Savior. In your name we pray, amen.